Fantastic. Um, so what's that like? Three good maps? One of them being a Splatoon 1 map that was also good? <laughs> like... Uh... Map design is an integral part of any shooter game, especially one like Splatoon where movement and specials are so important. Which is why I have a big problem with Splatoon 2's map design, with many stages having some serious issues. So today I want to talk about what exactly makes them bad, why Splatoon 1 did things a lot better, and how we could really use more stages like that in Splatoon 3. I make content on Splatoon all the time, so if you enjoy this and want to see more from me, be sure to subscribe. And without further ado, let's get into it. Let's start this off with the main problem. Most of the stages have really forced mid-fights because the stages themselves are cramped and small. So for our first example, let's look at Inkblot Art Academy. Now, Chargers set up on top mid can be very strong on this map because they can put just a lot of laser pressure that can prevent you from moving off the plat itself. So what options does the map give you to move? Well, basically nothing. There is one drop option on the left side, this area down here, but this is on permanent low ground where you have to jump up two blocks or go into an area that's basically right where you're gonna drop from plat anyway. In other words, you're still really kind of screwed. The other option is the right side, which has all the same problems as the left side in terms of being low ground, but it's even harder to get there because once again, you have to peek ahead of where the charger can see in order to get there. This means that this stage has no real good approach options. Everything is a very linear one way to enter the stage. And this brings me into why this kind of stage design is a problem. You are now reliant on something like Tena Missiles in order to move people. Now, a special with the focus on displacement isn't exactly a bad thing, but when it's your only option, it makes the play of the stage very linear. If you want to move in against a good charger, you're going to need missiles, and then you move forward from this general one direction, because the other two routes just aren't very good. Now, occasional flanks can work from here, but flanks and alternate pushing options are two very different things. Flanks are only for very specific aggressive and fast-paced weapons, and even then, these aren't great flanking routes. This can also apply to a stage with multiple entrance points. Let's look at Manta. There's two drops over here, there's street you can go forward to, you can go up top, you can go on this side flank angle, but all of these options will take you to the same place, mid. You have to go through this area in order to move anywhere on the map. There's no option that allows you to go completely around and have alternate pushing in options. You are forced to go in through middle or interact with the center of the stage. This is why stuff like bomb launchers and booyah bomb can be so oppressive. There's not many options to push in, especially when the areas you do drop from are incredibly small and don't really have any way to back up effectively because there's just a bunch of walls behind you. Basically, the game's map design really forces you to fight in mid all the time, with no real room for moving around in other directions. Let's look at Sturgeon real quick. This is another stage with a cramped mid problem, though admittedly not as bad, but it also has the issue of entering into the map. This option for moving in is just inherently terrible because you're going up a ledge, up another ledge, people can attack you from here, people can attack you from here, people can attack you from here. You don't really have a good option from this angle. What about Snipe? Well, if this thing is rotated up, you effectively have to climb another wall, and any kind of tri slosher, octobrush, etc. weapon will kill you. Even something like a shooter for just shooting over the ledge. So this place is another, like Inkblot Top Mid, that forces you to use specials in order to clear people. So that leaves two options, an incredibly mediocre flank angle because you end up getting stuck in permanent low ground, or your one actual approach option where you can maybe get into the stage. This is another example of special being really forced to get in, and even if you want to allow all of the other options, you still have to go through mid in one way or another to access the rest of the stage. It's really small and cramped once you get into middle. Now, the outside of the stage doesn't really have this problem as much, and this is where these stages can get a lot better. Say the enemy team is pushed up into your court here. You actually have quite a bit of options to deal with this. You can go from this side, this side, this side, this side, and suddenly you actually have ways of playing the map. You can even ignore it and go around this outside route to actually flank into mid, which is where this route sees some actual use. So in many cases, the mid itself feels way more cramped than the rest of the stage, but because mid is where everything actually happens, especially in a mode like zones, it really hurts the game. So what's one of the few stages that does this right? Let's look at Reef, which is a pretty good example. Like with Inkblot, it has the same kind of top mid oppressive area where ranged weapons put a lot of pressure, but unlike Inkblot, you are not forced to use specials to deal with it. Your spawn area is so varied that you can end up going this angle for a flank route, you can drop in this way, you can of course come from the normal way, you can also go all the way around this side, and if you drop here, you can climb all the way around and flank the bridge. 
Now look at how many options there are to get in and push someone like a ranged weapon out of the way. Now does this take away Tenem missiles being a great option for this? No. If you really want to clear the bridge, which is still the most important position in the map, you can absolutely launch Tenem missiles here. But you don't need to. There's actual options to go around the map and enter areas like behind them or going underneath them or going on this side and pressuring bridge. You suddenly have other ways of playing the map besides having to be entirely dependent on special coordination. And this map gets even better in modes like Rainmaker and Clan Blitz, where this becomes another large flank route. Now let's look at Pit, and I'm aware this is a Splatoon 1 map, it's just a great example. This has many different options to push in. From the side you can go down and over here, and if you get this area, you would now have a route to flank all the way around and potentially go behind the enemy. You can drop straight into middle, you can go through this tiny area. There's a ton of different options on this right side of the map. And the left side is also pretty solid. You can push up to the conveyor, go through middle, or join people on the right side, especially with the addition of this sponge here that allows you to reposition rather easily. Additionally, if you're locked out and people are in this area, you have a whole grating area to contest them. This whole section is something where you can crossfire or set up drops. There's so many different options to move in that you now have more ways to get into the map. Again, specials aren't invalidated, they're still really helpful and you're probably going to use some of them, but there are so many more options for how you want to move into middle. I can't really stress enough how important having options into middle and multiple approach routes is. You can't just blame the specials themselves when the stage layouts are part of the problem. We need stages that allow more freedom of movement and have more than one way to get through the middle of the stage. While this is most of Splatoon 2's stage design problems, there are a few other things that are worth getting into, and first up is designing stages around specific range values. I'm looking at you, Albacore Hotel. If we go off of what I talked about previously, this stage doesn't have that bad design problems. You can move into mid from a variety of different ways. The problem this stage has is that, oh my god, what do you do if you're short ranged? Want to go through mid? Hopefully you're going to be okay because it's all flat. Want to go the flank angle? Guess what? Over here is all flat. This is the one area that actually has some height variance to it. This area is basically just one solid straight slope. Just good luck moving anywhere, you know? It's just way too much focus on only enabling ranged weapons. Now, I'm not saying stages can't favor a certain weapon range, that's completely fine, but if the stage is unplayable for short or long-range weapons, then it's a problem. To be fair to our long-range weapon friends over here, let's take a look at Muscle Forge Fitness, a stage that's completely unfair to long-range weapons. This is the only real place for snipers or other ranged weapons to go, somewhere that's easily pressurable with bombs, since part of it isn't even inkable and the whole area is very condensed and small. What's the point of having a range advantage here if you can just get bombed out of it super easily? Additionally, people aren't even going to be sitting in mid, most of the short range is going to be going in this trench area, somewhere long range weapons can't even really affect. This means that especially the higher up you go, this is a stage that can feel incredibly unplayable for long range weapons, and thus has the same problem of Albacore, just it's less noticeable because there's way more short range weapons than long range ones. Another problem Splatoon 2 has is porting a ton of bad stages. Now, maybe this is absolutely Gigabrain, and Nintendo's plan is to port over the bad Splatoon 1 stages so it can have all the good ones to port to Splatoon 3, but I'm gonna ignore that possibility for now. First of all, there are so many ports that are just a straight line, a problem that leads to what I mentioned earlier, basically good luck getting into mid because it's all coming from one direction. But these are also stages that barely worked in Splatoon 1. What are your approach options on Walleye? Like, yeah, it's a bit more split up. You have this drop that's maybe decent, but besides that, you have going straight into mid in the line of fire or walking through a small, tiny closed area where any weapon that's mid-range can just pre-fire and keep you out. Additionally, these stages have a really bad defensive phase, where you have stuff like this where it's almost impossible to push back in because the spawn region is tiny. This is also something that wouldn't fit well with Splatoon 3's mid-air spawn and jumping in whatsoever, which is good because it means we won't get stages like this. I'll talk about the Splatoon 1 stages later because they're a bit different than Splatoon 2, but outside of Blackbelly, which is a solid stage, and Anchovy and Pit, which are good stages, all of the other ports are complete trash. Also, for the small note on Anchovy, while it's an overall fine stage, the main positions of the map being these tiny areas means stuff like Booyah Bomb and Tenem Missiles are really good at forcing people out of position, which means they oftentimes get spammed. Finally, I want to talk about a problem that hurts both Splatoon 1 and Splatoon 2 stages. Here we have Pit, one of the best stages in the game. It looks great, doesn't it? 
What the hell is this? Stages in this game are designed to be played on every single mode, which leads to stuff like this, because Piranha Pit Rainmaker is terrible. Forget about this amazing area, it's basically unusable now. Instead, the map is now a wide, one-angled push. Oh my god, what does this look like? It looks like another port, walleye, etc. Just bigger. Same problem. Look at Camp Triggerfish. This stage isn't great, but if you put it on something like Tower Control, it becomes a living nightmare, because the tower path goes over water. Rainmaker is a mode that's great for its multiple push options and freedom you have because you carry the objective. Now let's put it on Inkblot where you have one way to push because this area is terrible and there's no way to climb the wall over here without using glitches, and all of a sudden now this map mode is also garbage. I don't even need to talk about this one, you guys already know. We have 92 map and mode combinations, not including Turf War. We don't need this many. This can also make stage design much easier if it's only played on one or two ranked modes, because now you can build a stage to work pretty well for Tower Control, or Clam Blitz, or Rainmaker, rather than just having it try to be something that works in every single one. It's a lot bigger of a problem than you might think, and most of the bad map mode combinations that exist, exist because Nintendo forces every single mode to be on every single map. So that's the many problems with Splatoon 2 stages, but what about Splatoon 1? If you haven't played this game, you might be surprised to know that the stage design in Splatoon 1 was actually very different. So let's get into that now. While Splatoon 2 stages are mostly formulaic and don't have too much differences between them, Splatoon 1's all have a gimmick. Here's Bluefin being split down the middle, Flounder Heights with its emphasis on, well, heights and climbable walls to mid, Hammerhead Bridge with a large graded bridge across the entire middle of the stage, Mahi Mahi Resort, which actually has two overheads because the water level changes when the score reaches a certain point or enough time passes. Moray Towers has an emphasis on verticality and climbing up and down the stage. Museum de Alfonsino has the spinners across the entire stage. Piranha Pit with its conveyors. Salt Spray Rig with it being mirrored instead of flipped. I think you get the picture. Pretty much every Splatoon 1 stage feels unique from each other because it has a defining feature. And while this doesn't make a stage good, in fact many of these aren't good stages, it does make it feel special, which is why there's still a lot of Moray Towers or Salt Spray Rig fans, because where else are you going to find an experience like those maps? Whether you like it or not, if you enjoy the feel of that stage, you're not going to find it anywhere else. Now, some people will say that Splatoon 1 stages are a lot less safe, and you're right. If you build something around a gimmick and that gimmick is bad, then all of a sudden you're going to have a really horrible time playing on that map. However, it means that Splatoon 2 stages, while they do play safer and aren't anywhere near as bad as the bad Splatoon 1 maps, don't really reach anywhere of the highs or feel that distinct either. I also don't see the point of playing it safer if you're going to rework stages. Stages like The Reef, Starfish Main Stage, Humpback Pump Track, and Schellendorf Institute have gotten major changes. Splatoon 1 only had Urchin Underpass as a stage that got majorly changed, whereas in Splatoon 2 the devs clearly aren't afraid to do so, so why not play it riskier when you can fix your mistakes? I'm not saying to abandon Splatoon 2 stage design either. Having safer layouts is okay, but they shouldn't be the majority of stages. There should be things that feel distinct and unique that players can latch onto. Side note, Splatoon 2 actually has one stage that has a gimmick, Wahoo World, in which the gimmick is that the main way to enter mid is gone for half the stage. Yeah, this one is terrible. Outside of that, it suffers from the same problem most Splatoon 2 stages does, which is that the other options to get in are absolutely terrible and easy to stuff, especially since they're from low ground when you then have to climb a wall. I don't have too much to say in terms of how to make gimmicks because it's really up to how the stage maker wants to do it, but don't make a gimmick that takes away options from people, please. There's also one more really interesting thing to note about Splatoon 1 stages. Urchin was originally terrible and then they made it good. Notice how August 5, like August 5 right here, I don't know what the f they did in August of 2015, but from that point on, Splatoon 1 was, was just f***ing fantastic, right? Because they added Flander, Hammerhead, Museum, Resort, Pit, and Anchovy, all of which were good maps. And they also redid um, Urchin, which became a good map. Post-August 2015, Splatoon 1 had excellent maps. Splatoon was a very new concept when it launched, and after a little bit of time, the devs really got used to how to make stages. So outside of just the amazing gimmicks that they chose, let's look at how the stages fit these options that I mentioned Splatoon 2 stages fail at. First up is Flounder Heights, a map with a unique emphasis on verticality in the middle of the stage. 
First of all, there's infinitely many approach options because so many of these walls are inkable. This whole thing is climbable. This whole thing is climbable. You can go around through middle. This entire thing is climbable. This is climbable. This is climbable. You can walk up through here. There are so many ways to enter the middle of the stage. And even if we go back to this trench area, you can come from here, from here, from here, from here, from here, from here. There are so many ways to enter the map that it doesn't feel claustrophobic whatsoever. There are so many ways you can actually move forward. And something else we've mentioned is that it could be alienating the chargers. Now I'm on paint.net, so I don't really have a charger, so we can pretend this little buddy over here is a sniper player. Now, this is definitely a stage that isn't as favorable to snipers as favor short range, but you still have sight lines across the middle of the map if you want to choose there. You can still stand on high ground and apply pressure to people below you. There is still a snipe position, and in fact you can actually climb all the way on top of this thing to have a good amount of high ground in which you can put pressure from. Something like Splatoon 2's Explosher or Ballpoint would actually play very well here, because the uninkable tops Ballpoint can run across, beacons are great here, Explo can log from trench and play around. This actually fits Splatoon 2's backlines even better than they do Splatoon 1. It definitely favors short-range weapons, but in this case there are actual options for any weapon class. Next up, we have Mahi Mahi. This is a very long-ranged favored map. You have stuff like Snipe over here, you have a position over here. There are plenty of places for chargers to go, including when you're set up. It's obviously a very flat and open stage. Probably the comparison you want to make here is to Albacore. But while Albacore is very flat and linear, this stage has so many options to move around. People can go all the way around these boxes and flank with a bit of cover to get around snipers. You can move into mid in all of these different ways from this side, you can drop in from this side in which, hey look, an option of cover so you can actually sit behind something. You can come around this side, make the jumps over here, you can come from top. There are different angles. If you sit up here with an E-leader, you cannot patrol absolutely this entire field of view. You just don't reach that far and can't look at every single area at once and it gets even better when the water level drops. Not only is this an amazing concept because it gives you more stage and terrain to paint over and play on, but now you can see there are even more movement options. Nothing here is taken away. If anything, there's even more options and cover to get around and move through the stage. This also doesn't completely alienate backlines. It has more room for them to play on too, and it's still a stage that favors them, but now there's actual options. Another point is you can see this large area of mid for fights to happen in. You don't have to approach mid from this one direction. There is a good amount of split variety, so fights can happen in multiple places in addition to flank angles. One more example, let's look at bridge. Here's a stage that still has the kind of up and down nature. It's still very flat here, but the bridge introduces a good bit of high ground. There are still flanking routes going from the sides with plenty of cover for you to hide around. So there are many options you can do on this stage. It's not super limiting. Short range weapons have the options to go underneath, climb up to the bridge at various points and have many ways of getting into mid where long range weapons obviously have the patrol advantage of bridge and also other high grounds on the side for them to exist on. The stage works out absolutely beautifully. The latter half of Splatoon 1 stages not only feel unique, but they check all the boxes of stage design, which is why I think they're absolutely essential to bring back. And this brings us to Splatoon 3. I don't want to spend too much time on the stages because they're likely still in beta, but Scorch Gorge looks amazing so far, and Museum was one of the best Splatoon 1 maps, so I'm happy to have it back. Instead, I actually want to talk a little bit about Zipcaster. A good movement special can really increase the feel of the stage, and while we've seen this a little bit with Inkjet, Zipcaster seems to be this option to perfection. I mean, just look at it being shown off in Museum. That is no coincidence. You can see how that option allows you to zip across the map, giving you even more options to approach or make plays happen. While a lot of Splatoon 2's displacement specials end up hurting how the game feels, I think in Splatoon 3's case, some of the specials really seem to enhance it, and I hope it's a trend we continue to see more of as we learn a lot more about the game. My hopes for Splatoon 3 stages is that they won't be as cramped and small, especially in mid, which should have multiple options to push in and get fights, not just relying on displacement specials. Don't have a stage that completely alienates a specific weapon range, it's really annoying to have to deal with that, and be careful what stages you port. Nintendo's changes to things like port mackerel were actually pretty good, but there's only so much you can do when the stage is really bad to begin with. It's okay to not have stages with every single mode. It allows you to specialize them for specific modes and reduces a lot of the bad map mode combinations. We'll live without Piranha Pit Rainmaker, I promise. Let stages feel distinct and unique from each other. It's okay for them to have a cool mechanic or something that separates them from other maps, and it'll allow people to like them even more. 
And finally, keep it up with the movement options from both specials and the ones we have in default. They can allow people to have more freedom of expression with movement, which will only complement the good map design further. I hope if nothing else, this video has taught you that map design is really important, and with Splatoon 3 already bringing back one of my all-time favorite stages with potential for more, I feel like Splatoon 3 is going to have the best maps that we've ever seen.